some of the perspectives and some of the approaches that I want to talk about today have really shifted my uh, understanding of some books like Jeremiah as well as other parts of the Old and New Testaments. And they've been really important to me personally and as I think about how to teach and how to talk about the Bible with other people. So I hope that will be an experience for you, but don't worry, I'll give you the chance at the end to tell me uh, how, how it's all resonated or not with you. So let's take a, a couple of steps back. I never assume that anybody knows anything about a biblical book when I come, which I think is always a safe assumption. But the, the most important thing that's going to kind of ground the way that I talk about Jeremiah today is you got to understand its time and its place. So this is, you know, a map. It's not the map. But it's reminding us that the book of Jeremiah talks about events that took place when this large empire known as either the Babylonian or you're going to get fancy, the Neo-Babylonian Empire, ruled all the way from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean Sea and into Egypt. The, the period that we're talking about are like the, the 600s BCE, which is the more common way of using the BC uh, AD things now. We tend to use BCE before the Common Era in a recognition of our Jewish neighbors and interfaith neighbors that might not want to only recognize time based on Jesus' birth, even though that's really important to us. And so this little area, the, the little tiny country that Jeremiah is going to be at such great pains to talk about where it stands in God's purposes is just right here. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to touch it. Uh, just, I really didn't mean to touch your screen. <laughs> it's just right here. So you can see the city of Jerusalem and uh, the country of Judah. The period we're talking about, this land is really tiny and especially tiny when you compare it to the vast empire of the Babylonians. Empire is a key way of understanding the book of Jeremiah and the book is going to lead us, it's going to talk about invasion after invasion when the Babylonian armies actually came into Jerusalem, came into Judah, killed people, slaughtered people, disrupted the government, um, and, as we'll talk about, de forcibly deported different groups of the population at least three times. So time and place is something that I wanted to have us have really clear back in our head. The book of Jeremiah is long, and, and that's why I went ahead last week and said, look, we're not going to walk through this whole book in two weeks. That's ridiculous. Um, it's a very long book. One of the longest in the Old Testament, and it's very complicated because it's not order, it's not ordered in a very clear linear fashion. It's got these chunks, and the, the chunks kind of jump around. So, you know, if you ever get really bored someday and you want to go start reading Jeremiah commentaries, you can find out that like you have to be really bored. Um, you would find out that like it's hard to find two biblical scholars who study this stuff for a living that agree how to explain how and why the book of Jeremiah is organized. But the, this would be a way of understanding it. So it, it starts out, it's got a lot of poetry. That's going to be important for us today too. Jeremiah does tell stories, but it's also language, a lot of its language is poetry, which has a lot of imagery, it has a lot of exaggeration, um, it, it's very stark. Um, and predominantly, that, that first really big chunk, and, and we'll, we'll encounter some of this today, it, it will be over and over, over and over, God's judgment on Judah during this time. Then 
we'll get a nice little interlude of some stories that we talked about last time. Some people know some of those stories. Uh, Jeremiah going to a potter's house. Jeremiah doing this thing or that thing. Um, and then right there, uh, pretty much in the middle, are just three chapters of hope and comfort. We looked at last week, those are the passages that the Revised Common Lectionary typically pulls out for Christians to read, not anything else. There's a few other parts of that. Um, and we'll, I'll suggest again why I think that's problematic. Then we get some more prose. I should have said stories. That would make more sense, right? So, some stories about the king. And then this is one of our accounts in the Bible that actually tells us what happened when the Babylonian armies came into Jerusalem. It, it will describe the, the, uh, what happened with the king, what happened with the temple, the burning of the temple to the ground. It'll tell us about that. It'll tell us about how the city was under siege before that, people being starved out. It'll tell us about who got taken away, right, in, in these two, at least two of the deportations. So we, we hear about that. And then, out of nowhere, the book of Jeremiah, it comes and starts and gives you these oracles, these statements of judgment against other nations, other ancient nations like the Edomites and the Ammonites and Egypt. Um, and well, you might imagine that really gets scholars interested. What's that doing there? Why is that there? And then it ends with another story that tells us what life was like back in the land of Judah and Jerusalem after the temple was burned and after a large amount of the population was exiled. And it tells us about how the Babylonians put people in leadership and people fearful. We hear about people fleeing even after the Babylonian destruction. Um, and this, uh, it does even tell us about a lot of the Jewish people who went to Egypt. I don't know if you know that. There was a large Jewish community in Egypt already by the 400s, 300s. So this, this is what's in the book of Jeremiah. And because it's so big and complicated, I thought, why, why not go to the heart of the matter? Let's talk about some big themes in the book of Jeremiah. So I, I mentioned these last time. These are harsh, right? And I said this at least four times last week, so I'll say it probably at least that many times this time. This is not my theology. This is the book of Jeremiah's theology, right? And so we're going to talk about how do I feel so confident to say that, right? But I will. But uh, Jeremiah says that uh, over and over says God will punish Judah for not being obedient to the covenant with God, and we can look at some passages to see, like, well, what did they do? Like, what was so disobedient about it? And, and because of that, God is sending the Babylonian armies to destroy Judah. That is a start. If that claim doesn't bother you, right, right, then let's have a little chat, shall we? Like, that should bother you. I mean, it is, it is. I mean, there's, there's so many dimensions to it that, that God is doing, that God punishes that way, in that way. God punishes a nation in that way. And God orchestrates, and Jeremiah is not the only book that says it, that God orchestrates military campaigns in order to make God's purposes known. And I'll say again, that's not my theology. Right? But Jeremiah claims this. Uh, incredible, like not just once, not just twice, like over and over and over again. And, right, try this one if you're out on the public square somewhere in, um, you know, in uh, Hershey or, or my case in Lancaster, or if you're like, you know, do anything else, that it is God's will um, that Judah, in this case, should submit to invaders. That fighting back against the Babylonian invaders would be going against God's will. 
So you can imagine if you would kind of change that, you know, change the characters, the players in the story, and you say, you know, it's God's will. And I'm even scared to say it because it's going online. And uh, Dr. Jeremiah Wright could tell you those <laughs> bad things. You say what the text is saying, and then that gets lifted up as what you are, are saying. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. Well, uh, go, go, you know, go search it anyway. But if, if you said that about your country, right, who knows what kind of reaction that you would get. I wonder if you would get thrown in a cistern just like Jeremiah did or worse. These are major claims of the book of Jeremiah. So last time, again, we're still reviewing just a little bit because you fell asleep last week. Uh, the, how have Christians tended to deal with this book? Well, <laughs> Christians do what we always do, and that is we pick the parts we like. So the lectionary does it. It picks the passages of happy, happy, leaves the other stuff Behind. So a lot of people don't even know about the passages in the book of Jeremiah. Um, they read, we read, or Christians have tended to read, not only selectively, but everything that they've read, they say, well, that, that's about Jesus. So the passages that are in the lectionary during Advent and Lent about the new covenant that's going to come being written on people's heart, or a new branch from the line of David, uh, historically Christians have said, see, that's Jesus. God preparing the way for Jesus, that was part of the plan, see, um, connect the dots. Um, similarly to that, right, it's, it's a strategy of, of where Christians tend, they'll take anything that's comforting and apply it to ourselves, like that's God's promise to us, but anything that's negative, anything that's judgmental, oh, that was for those bad people. That was for those bad people in the past, and tragically, over the history of Christianity, those, the, those bad people have continued to be identified as contemporary Jewish people. I mean, the potential for anti-Jewish attitudes is really rampant um, with that kind of approach where you know you say oh the promises are for us but the the judgment is for other people perhaps you can tell I think all of those approaches are really problematic right because if, if you're just taking a passage that says what you want to start with what's the point in reading it you just is what we call it confirmation bias you, you've only read the things that fit your theology anyway, so why bother? And I find it really problematic when Christians only read the Old Testament and apply everything directly to Jesus because it leaves out, right, the ongoing work that God is doing with the Jewish people in the present and the power of these books and what they were saying in their own right. And it feeds that stereotype, which I, I think talking about Jeremiah might feed it, whether I fight it or not, of this idea that the Old Testament is going to talk about an angry God, whereas the New Testament talks about a loving God, which is a bunch of bunk. The church has said that is a bunch of bunk for centuries, and nobody's listening, or the church is two-faced about it. They say we're not going to say it, and then they do. That, that's really bad theology. So maybe we could do a, a whole other series about, which I think I talked here years ago about that, 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 uh, that that's really bad understandings uh, of the Old and New Testament. Um, and maybe today will help with that just a little bit as well. So I'm going to uh, offer an alternative, and it's reflecting some work that's being done in Old Testament studies, like right now. It's like one of the big growth industries in actually biblical studies for the Old Testament and New Testament. And that is to apply trauma studies to understanding where the Bible comes from and where books like Jeremiah come from. 
So I don't know all your professions. So if you're in, in hospital settings, if you're in public education or maybe even private education, uh, if you're in other kind of spaces, maybe you're getting some of those, that kind of training in trauma-informed care. Like our, my husband and I have three daughters between us. All of them are uh, leaders, uh, principal, assistant principal, and reading specialists in public uh, elementary schools. That, that is the thing that they are being uh, trained in and training others of what does trauma do to uh, a person's brain, to their processing, to their emotional regulation. How do you respond to somebody recognizing, asking the question not what happened, you know, what's wrong with you, but, but what happened to you? And how to help people, how to meet someone where they are in terms of their traumatic experiences, but also what are appropriate ways of uh, processing that. I've done a little, we've done some of that work at Lancaster Seminary. We, we have a lot of students, and I don't think this is unique to us, but a lot of folks who go to theological schools, it is because they have experienced their own traumas, whether it's family trauma, uh, other kinds of assault trauma, other uh, community traumas such as racism, right, which is a deep level of trauma. And one of the things that uh, uh, many of our students do, they're, they're working on their own trauma and they want to help other people. So we have an increasing number of people who are seeking to be chaplains, who are doing this kind of work. So our seminary, our faculty, um, has been doing some work and getting some of this kind of training. Um, and it's helped me immensely understand some of the reactions. Like when I tell a student something where they think they weren't perfect on a paper, why, for some people, I get like what seems to me really disproportionate reactions to that. You start hearing somebody's story, you, you understand uh, that on a, a deeper level. So my claim is that, or, or at least the thing I'm gonna invite you to kind of experiment with me today, is what would happen if we read the book of Je Jeremiah as a theological processing of a national trauma. So, to do that, I know I already showed you a map, and I, I put you in, you know, I, uh, I, I gave you a map, and I told you what time period, but I don't know about you, but sometimes when I hear words like that, like exile, destruction, it, it doesn't, it feels like a cartoon thing from the past, or I expect it to be in black and white, or it's hard to feel the emotional depth of it. So one of the things that I started doing when I, when I think about issues like this, oh, yeah, we're not gonna talk about that. I'll change I'll come back. I try to think about, even though it's not gonna be a perfect parallel, that when I hear a word about something in the ancient world, I try to find a photograph of something like that in the modern world. Because I, I wanna understand, I wanna not get immune to the emotional impact. So I said earlier, military invasion. This is all over our news right now with Ukraine. Again, not perfect examples. No two military conflicts are alike, but I've been thinking about in what ways is the invasion of Ukraine similar to the invasion of Jerusalem where you've got a country that has been independent for some of its history, that has been under the control of other people for some of its history, um, but all of the, the hand-wringing and the uh, concerns, and I got, a, I got an origami pen last, uh, uh, pen last week to support Ukraine. I mean, I was just trying to think, okay, so when you hear military 
the invasion, what happens if you think Ukraine? What happens if you think about other places around the world where military um, invasion is stopping national sovereignty? Um, and when you hear words like exile, oops, let's go back. Right, this is forced deportation. So uh, we know that this is true in Ukraine. We also know that it is true around the world. We hear a lot of stories about uh, refugees right now of people fleeing violence or fleeing poverty or fleeing. Um, you know, drought, famine, and all of that. But there are also people who are fleeing military conflicts. Uh, the judo situation, a little bit different, that people forcibly taken by the armies and marched and put in other places. So those of you who are world history buffs, you know, you might think about Armenia, you might think about other places where people are, forcibly taken from their spaces in the context of a violent conflict where some people are killed. And I, I must say, every military conflict that we've ever known about, rape is a major uh, instrument of war. Right? So you, you're, you're going to have that. You're going to have death. You're going to have devastation, infrastructure destruction. You're going to do that. Th these are... Uh, major human traumas. Right, that affect children, that affect women, that affect men, that affect old people, and all that. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys? <laughs> well, you know, life happens. So, you know, forced deportations are things that uh, we can think about in our own history as in the United States. And, you know, speaking as a white person, I, my ancestors didn't experience that. They were probably on the problematic side of this. So we can think about forced deportations of people in slavery. We can think about it in lots of ways. But if you get my point, is that until we start recognizing that the trauma that the destruction of Jerusalem and the lead up to it might have been, it's kind of hard to appreciate anybody who's going to be trying to process kind of what that happened. And again, not to, uh, I hope I'm not offending anybody here. Oh, there's another forced deportation. But you know, when we talk about military occupation, you know, maybe, I don't know if any of you are, are veterans or have family members who are veterans. These are things that we also know about as somebody who's been from a country who's done that. Uh, military uh, occupation in Afghanistan and other places. So the, the stories that we're hearing in the book of Jeremiah are both they're really old, but they're also touching on some really... Uh, powerful human kind of traumas. So I thought I would mention, in case you're interested in, in like saying, well, I might want to read a little bit more about trauma and all of that. I, I thought I would just give you a couple of things that you, know, you might want to look at. Uh, David Carr is a professor at Union Theological Seminary. I think he's still there. And so he has this book called uh, Holy Resilience, The Bible's Traumatic Origins. His claim is that both the Old Testament as a whole and the New Testament were put together by people who were in trauma. So if you think about the fact that, um, and I'll go back to this in just a minute, one of the big things for us to remember is that the book of Jeremiah was not written in the moment. It, it was written by people in the aftermath. And I'll uh, point out that a little bit more. But that's true for the whole Old Testament. We have really good reasons to believe that all of the Old Testament was edited and finally put together after these traumatic events 
in part trying to process some of them. Some of the materials are even uh, younger than that, you know, um, after Jeremiah. But there's a big, even the stuff that talks about earlier time periods might have been reshaped in order to respond to this trauma. So some people are reading the book of Genesis in light of trauma studies, or the book of Exodus. Like, yeah, they, they talk about events that took place much earlier, but they were copied and passed down and edited by people who had been through this trauma. Um, the same thing would be true of the New Testament. When you say, what trauma New Testament? Well, uh, the, the death of Jesus would have been incredibly traumatic to the earth first followers, right? That in and of itself. Roman occupation of Judea, which we tend to downplay as like, oh, the Romans, weren't they nicer than the other guys? No. Uh, you know, um, there's a reason why the New Testament doesn't talk too much about the Romans, and it's not because they were nice people. No. Um, it's also true that most, almost all of the New Testament, except maybe the letters of Paul, were probably themselves not written down until after the Romans had destroyed Jerusalem again. So in the aftermath of that destruction, so, you know, Jeremiah's temple gets, the, time, the temple at the time of Jeremiah gets destroyed. It will eventually get rebuilt. It gets destroyed again by the Romans a couple of decades after Jesus' death. So the, the trauma of the New Testament community is also really clear. So, what are the big uh, kind of uh, mandates or the, the cause of trauma studies is to recognize that those who've gone through trauma are both trying to process their suffering, but also that there are always going to be mechanisms of resilience. And the, the goal of, of working with that is how do you help feed the mechanisms of resilience, right? because the trauma never goes away. It, it, it doesn't get better, but the resilience from it can be increased. So what uh, Carr is claiming that uh, these, these biblical books that we have are written by people who are trying to, to process some of that material and um, they help communities endure catastrophe rather than be devastated by it. So what does it mean to be able to endure and find resiliency strategies afterwards? So uh, Carr's book is about trauma in the Bible in general. Um, this is just a, a beautiful book um, if you really want to look more at Jeremiah. Uh, Kathleen O'Connor is just, anything she writes is just excellent. Um, Kathleen, if you find this, you're great. Um, so uh, Kathleen, she was a professor at theological, uh, Columbia Theological Seminary, the Presbyterian Seminary for a long time. And in this beautiful little book that she has called Jeremiah, Pain and Promise, what she actually does is she applies trauma studies to the book of Jeremiah. And so what she's, I'm gonna share with you a little bit of some of what she does along with some of what I've done with that. Um, and, and what she's trying to do, and can you see why I've had this picture in the background the whole time? Right. Uh, this, this is a book, this is actually a photograph of a statue in Dresden after the bombing of World War II. That, that this is a, a book, a perspective, that's looking out over devastation, trying to make sense of it, and how to help a community endure and find resiliency instead of to be devastated. Okay. So uh, what I'd like to do um, is to give you just a couple of quotes from uh, O'Connor so you can get a sense of like how she's looking at that, and then we're going to look at some passages. I have a handout. So, uh, and those of you who are online, the handout's somewhere on the website, so you can start looking for it um, <laughs> as you go along. Um, again, Kathleen O'Connor. 
Disasters brought by traumatic violence disturb what people, oh, this should say, think, feel, and believe. Human beings cannot absorb extreme violence as it occurs. They simply cannot take it in. Uh, and just a minute. Yeah, that, that'd be great. And then, uh, so if you know anything about PTSD, um, even if your exposure to it is from movies, you know that people process trauma that's happened to them in nonlinear and unexpected ways. Flashbacks, uh, physical sensations that you don't know where they come from. Um, it, it's a, it disrupts all of the neural pathways and it gets in the body. Um, there's a famous book by a psychologist says the body keeps the score. You know things in your body that even you're not maybe intellectually aware of. Uh, just a footnote there, I had a friend who was a massage therapist who had to get out of the profession because she said it was too emotionally intense that she could touch somebody uh, you know, like maybe this part of the shoulder, and they would have a trauma. It would be a trauma trigger because of something that had happened in their past and their experience. And she said it was so emotionally traumatic even for her to see the weeping and the processing of people's bodily remember, memory of trauma that she said, I, I just I need a break. So, uh, uh, Kathleen O'Connor then goes into the book of Jeremiah, and she says, you know, what happens if I, if I read this book that's got a lot of violence in it, that's got a lot of um, judgment in it, um, and, and what would that mean like to read Jeremiah as a community that, had pro that was processing what had happened to it? Here's her conclusion. Rather than confronting matters head on, Jeremiah tells and retells the catastrophe indirectly, metaphorically, in images, in unforgettable poetic ways. So what, what, let me stop there for a minute and then I'll read the second part of that. So what she's gonna say is we might, if we, if we were listening for it, we might hear behind Jeremiah's words, the actual experiences of people who had gone through this incredibly traumatic set of experiences. And if we train our ears to listen to that, we, we might hear that behind the language. Because the book is a work of art, you know, we, we tend to think of the, the Bible as just written down at God's word, but it's uh, it's something different than that. It's it's written, it's edited, it's put together, it's got imagery, it's got poetry, and that's why she's calling it a work, a work of art. Because the book is a work of art, it can provide language to enable Judean victims to speak of their disaster. And, here's where she comes to us, because it is art, it can reach through the age ages to touch people who have known many kinds of suffering. So she's saying this, that, that what, what's the book of Jeremiah good for? Is that it helps people process suffering and trauma. So, uh, one of the things we're going to think about is how could those themes, God will punish Judah for its disobedience to the covenant by causing their fall to Babylonian armies, and Judah should submit to Babylon, how could that be a resiliency strategy? And how could it have helped ancient people process some of their trauma? So we're going to play with that a little bit. Um, Oh, wait a minute, one more quote, and then we'll play with it a little bit. Here's, here's the way O'Connor would answer that question. She'll say, Jeremiah's claims, which sound problematic to me, make the help the world make sense. 
and they keep God from dis disappearing through a temporary stay of confusion. O'Connor will talk about Jeremiah as a temporary theology that helps people get through suffering. So, uh, what she's going to do then is to try to read the book in that kind of light. So now, Jack, let's have a handout. Let's look at a couple of passages from Jeremiah. If you're watching this through um, online or through the streaming and you can't find that handout, I'll kind of tell you which passages we're looking at, so you might want to have a Bible. Um, I've got a lot more here than than we'll look than we'll look at, but maybe um, I'll be a little bit selective. Um, let's look at that very first one from Jeremiah. It's chapter 17 um, at the beginning. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about that advances the themes of what God should, what God is doing. So, the sin of Judah is written with an iron pen. With a diamond point, it is engraved on the tablet of their hearts and on the horns of their altars. While their children remember their altars and their sacred poles bes beside every green tree and on the high hills on the mountains in the open country. Your wealth and your treasures I will give for spoil as the price of your sin throughout all your territory. By your own act, you will lose the heritage that I gave you, and I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know, for in my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. Now, if you didn't pick up on that, when, when the Bible talks about um, sacred poles and worshiping on the green hills, this was the way it tended to talk about uh, following the worshiping practices of Israel's neighbors. Whether it was actually true that that's the way that Israel's neighbors actually worshiped or not, the Bible will talk about uh, the fact that people would go out into the woods and have these, these poles and would worship the goddess Asherah, who was uh, another ancient Near Eastern goddess from the area. So in this passage, uh, the passage is claiming you worship the wrong gods, you did the wrong things, and because of your sins, therefore I'm going to do that to you. Uh, let's look at the next one, too. Like just like just so you get like how how sharp Jeremiah is about this. So, uh, chapter twenty-five, verse eight. Therefore, thus said the Lord of Hosts. So Jeremiah claims that it's not just him saying it; that it's God saying it. Because you have not obeyed my words, says God, I'm going to send for all the tribes of the north, says the Lord. Just in case you forgot, God's talking. Even for King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, my servant. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon did not worship Yahweh God of Israel, right? But here, a foreign king who's going to destroy you is being called God's servant. And I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants, against all these nations around. I will utterly destroy them, make them an object of horror and hissing and an everlasting disgrace. I will banish from them the sound of mirth, the sound of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's, those are the things I'm talking about that repeatedly, that's what this book claims. And... Um, what 
O'Connor is going to do by applying trauma studies to it is ask the question, how would believing that have helped foster the Judeans' resiliency in the aftermath of trauma? So you have a, a couple of passages here from Lamentations and Psalms that we're going to skip for a few minutes. I, I included them there because we do have a, other passages in the Bible that kind of lament what happened when the Babylonians came. But I want to go to that back page if, if you'll do it. So Jeremiah is often remembered as the weeping prophet because Jeremiah will kind of complain about uh, his situation. Um, my anguish, uh, this is chapter 4, verse 19. My anguish, my anguish, I writhe in pain. Oh, the walls of my heart, my heart is beating wildly, I cannot keep silent, for I hear the voice of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Disaster overtakes disaster. The whole land is laid waste. Suddenly my tents are destroyed. My curtains are in a moment. Can you hear behind Jeremiah's complaint the voice of a community that has just gone through something traumatic? Um, even though we often think of Jeremiah as like a single individual who did all of these things on his own, this kind of approach suggests that the book of Jeremiah is the book of a community and that they're using the character of Jeremiah to kind of stand in for them. He's, he's like the uh, representative of the community. So, so when he, in his weeping, can you hear the, the weeping of the community? Um, I'll look at another one, 431. In this case, Jeremiah is talking in a metaphor, a comparison, and he uses as a comparison the cry of a woman in labor. So he's talking about himself, but he says, I cry as a woman in, uh, I heard a cry as, it, as of a woman in labor, anguish as one bringing forth her first child. I'm sorry, this is Zion, uh, Jerusalem. The cry of daughter Jerusalem, gasping for breath, stretching out her hands, woe is me, I'm fainting before killers. So if you start, if you start reading Jeremiah, you can kind of hear, I can hear behind the story the reality of this devastation. Uh, the next one, chapter 9, verse 21 and following. Death has come up to our windows. It has entered our palaces, cut off the children from the streets and the young men from the squares. Speak, thus says the Lord. Human corpses shall fall like dung upon the open field like sheaves behind the reaper, and no one should gather them. Then the next passage, I'm not going to read it aloud, but you might see it yourself, is 1324. Jeremiah will make allusions to the rape uh, of people, that the devastation is like a rape. Jeremiah, as a book, presents the words like this, as being spoken before the events took place. The book was written after the events had taken place. It's, it's a book written in retrospect, looking back at Israel's experiences and kind of process them. I don't know if any of this is beginning to click for you, and but let me see, because I'm gonna ask a question. How could believing that it was God's will that your country fell to the Babylonians, and it was God's will because what you had done 
there any way that you can imagine that would actually build resiliency? I mean, it certainly makes it less out of control. You know, there's some predictability. If, if we do the right things, God will be on our side and not allow this to happen. And if we do the wrong things, then God will punish us and it's less um, chaotic. Ah. I don't know. Anybody else want to jump in there? To counter that, but what if you're doing the right things and these things happen? Then where do you go? That it was us being wrong about perceiving what God wanted. You yeah. Know, you know, we can always take the blame in some way, but God is the stable. I, I'm not saying I agree or disagree. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just... The, I'm just the rationality. I'm just being built. I'm throwing out a counter. No, but what, what I'm pointing out, and, and even if Connor would say this, she said, this is not good theology forever. Okay, in the it's, moment. But she's she's asking that in in the light of trauma, and then I'm going to ask if this helps us at all anyway, but I'm just kind of playing that out, is what she's saying is that that almost obscenely blaming yourself and seeing that God had given you the opportunity to, to do otherwise makes the world seem, you said it really beautifully, less chaotic, and it makes God still available to you. Now, again, not my theology, not what I actually think is healthy, long-term theology, but again, I've been... Um, I've been teaching for 35 years, but I've been at Lancaster Seminary for 25, 26, and I have seen this over and over again of people who've gone through traumatic experiences have come up with some explanation of why it happened to them that helps them get through the day. Right? But when I first started teaching it, I, you know, I, I would hear this theology and I would try to correct people <laughs> because I thought it was really horrific theology. But again, I began to listen to what role is that playing in your own life to believe? Because again, it would sound horrible to me. I was in a car accident and I believe God did that to get my attention. Not my theology. Uh, we have students who uh, work in, are trained to do hospice care or working in hospitals, and they'll talk about patients who've come up with an understanding of why this devastating illness has happened to them. And what it does is that it gives some sense of meaning to the world that you're not uh, completely adrift in a world that makes no sense. Some of you may have heard of the work of a psychologist called Viktor Frankl. Uh, Viktor Frankl uh, was a Jewish, uh, he was already trained in psychology before he and his family were deported to the Auschwitz and then Bergen-Belsen camps. All of his family, uh, he was the only survivor of his whole family. And so in the Dachau, um, and not Dachau, but in the Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen camps, which are right beside each other, what he began to do is to observe who survived. Not like who got along well with the German guards, but who had the mental, psychological resiliency to bear it all. And his finding, which he then worked on after he uh, was liberated from the camp and got, and got his PhD and began to work, is he said that people who have a sense of meaning and purpose in their life are much more likely to survive all kinds of trauma than people who don't. So he developed, actually there's a brand of psychotherapy called Logotherapy, where what you try to do is you, you listen to what meaning people have given to their events. And you begin to, to recognize that kind of meaning. And if you think it's hurting them, what kind of meaning they've made out of events, 
you in your artful, psychologically trained ways, help them find a new meaning in their events. And maybe you've been reading some of the same things I have recently. This is some of the major findings now about longevity. The three things that are the biggest indicators of longevity are, um, do you have social networks, right? Do you have, uh, can, do you get movement and, you know, can you uh, get active? And secondly, to have a sense of purpose in your life is a major indicator of longevity. Um, again, being done by secular scientists as well. So what, I think what O'Connor's trying to do is to say, what would happen if we quit taking those themes from Jeremiah as factoids, that is what, whoops, what God did in ancient Judah. And instead read this book and other books in the Bible as the theological processing of communities as people try to find God in their own time and place. And then the question becomes, what, how can we benefit from that? And, I mean, that's a, it's a lot harder work than just say, oh, I think I'll take all the happy stuff and uh, make myself feel better today. But one of the challenges that I think work like Frank on uh, Carr and O'Connor, and then I've been trying to do some of this work as well, is that when we do that, we're not asking people to bring their pain to church. We're, we're asking people to, to, to process the trauma of their lives somewhere else, and then come to church and accept the, the hope and comfort. Uh, if you've ever done any therapy, you know that it's very hard to, to have hope and resiliency in the future until you deal with the stuff that you got in that way. So, this is what I mean by reading this book as uh, a book of resiliency. So what does it mean to be able to think about how all of our theology is always uh, framed in the context of the world in which we live? And I find it helpful to read the Bible, not just to say, hmm, what can I grab that's going to get me through the day? but instead to recognize that, that there are resources here for communities in pain. And I've made a promise to myself, I will not speak anywhere or do any kind of teaching anymore where I don't talk about the climate catastrophe. If we are not talking about the climate catastrophe, the climate crisis, every minute, every day, every service, every thing that we're doing, then we're not paying attention to what's really going on out there. I think books like this are going to be really great, important resources for as our world changes, how are we going to process the incredible losses and changes that we're all going through? Um, they, they are accelerating some communities, particularly communities of color um, and lower socioeconomic, they're already feeling this. The climate refugees, the uh, folks that are being placed where all those new natural gas ports are going to be. They're, they're experiencing <coughs> these devastations already, um, and everybody will increasingly feel them. I'm sorry, it sounds like a doomsday because that's where I believe we are. Um, and so uh, resources like this, I think, are going to be really helpful if we process them well. And to think about how can we read those in ways that allow us to do the lament that recognize, in our case, God did not do this, we did it, right, in, in that kind of process. So there's a lot of really cool stuff going on about the Je book of Jeremiah. There's, there's also people who are now trying to read it, like uh, it's called post-colonial scholarship, where you look at what does it mean to be conquered by empire, and how does that affect the way people think and do theology based on empire. But I'm going to uh, not go through that right now. Right now, But I want to leave at least just a couple of minutes of, of where that leaves you with the book of Jeremiah. Do, any thoughts, feedbacks? Is, is this a helpful 
way to approach the book for you, or does it feel more intellectual or distant from your own needs and what's useful to you? I'd, I'd really like to hear that. I find it very helpful. I think it also invites us to to really think about how we process and read these books in community, um, too, even more so than the individual approach. Um, thinking about that community, kind of writing this book or the community process and coming into it. That's a really good insight. Um, one of the, I mean, I understand it and I benefit from it, but like this, this strategy that many of us have encountered of doing devotional with biblical passages where you know you take a passage and then you do your morning devotion you pray on it and then you go to work or you know then you go on with your day uh, of not really getting honest about what we see there and what does it mean to you and how do you respond to it that's really good insight you made me in an instant look at our American history in a whole different light. You mentioned you mentioned the blacks with the uh, slave trade. How about the Trail of Tears? How about how about the uh, Mexicans in the West Coast or the Japanese during World War II? Uh, I mean, it's just so many of those things happen in our own society that a lot of people are not aware of. They ignore them because it didn't affect them. Them. <clears throat> and they never learned them and probably will never be taught them. Uh, it's just, it, it just, it, right, it just opens your mind to all the possibilities that we we just ignore. And that just, to me, that I, I'm currently wrestling with Jeremiah. I'm trying to read through it with a small group. It's been tough. It's been, it's been very tough. Uh, hopefully when I get to pick it up again on Tuesday, uh, if this will help. Yeah, I, I, I'll uh, get a royalty. I mean, I'll get a cup from Kathleen O'Connor. Go, go, go see if she helps. She goes, I mean, it's, a, it's a beautiful little book. She even creates some imaginary autobiographies of people who experience the devastation of Jerusalem. Whether it would be for an old person, a young person, a woman, 